Hello. So now I'm going to do a quick tutorial using another example of um, how to determine the structure of a compound, ideally at least, using proton NMR. And in particular, um, the example I'm going to use here, we're given the chemical formula C5H10O. And now, uh, one thing that we want to realize is that I would also have to tell you, either give you access to the IR spectrum anytime that there's an oxygen, so that way you would know whether or not there's an alcohol or carboxylic acid or the lack thereof, or I would have to tell you, and so I'll just tell you right now that in this example here, there are no alcohols present in the IR spectrum. Also, we need to remember these three points. We have to look at the number of signals and what that in indicates, what the integration under the curve indicates, and then the splitting patterns, what they indicate. Okay, so first off, the number of signals, remember that tells you the different types of chemically non-equivalent hydrogens. So what kind of hydrogens are in different environments within the compound? The area under the curve tells you the um, number of hydrogens that's in that specific environment. So those are chemically equivalent hydrogens. And finally, the splitting utilizes the J plus 1 rule for the most part in proton NMR. And this is where J is equal to the total number of hydrogens on adjacent carbons. So for example, if you have a methyl group next to a CH2 group, then J is equal to 2. 2 plus 1 is 3, and so that will split into a triplet. Okay, the very first thing that you'll want to do is look at the, use the RDB equation. So if we just review real quick, remember RDB stands for rings and double bonds. And it is equal to 2 plus 2 times the total number of atoms in the molecule that will make 4 bonds. So essentially carbons plus Roman numeral 3, meaning the total number of atoms that would make 3 bonds of trivalent. So for us, for the most part, that's nitrogen, minus the total number of univalent atoms. So those are hydrogens and halogens, and all of this is divided by 2. Okay, so if we do that, in this instance, we're going to have RDB rings and double bonds is equal to 2, plus 2 times 5, because there are 5 carbons, plus 0, because there are no nitrogens, minus 10, all of that divided by 2, that's 2 plus 10 minus 10, so that's 2, divided by 2 is equal to 1, so we know we have one ring or one double bond present. Okay, now let's move on to the number of signals. So here we see that we have four different signals. One, two, three, and four. It doesn't matter. So we know we have four different types of hydrogens. It doesn't really matter where we start, but right now I'm going to go ahead and start here at the far end. What this means is that we have, if we look at this, we're going to have three hydrogens that are in identical environment. For this to happen, since we know that we only have a total of five carbons, we can't logically have three carbons, each with in the same environment, each only containing one hydrogen. Therefore, this kind of signal, when there's three, it's usually indicative of a methyl group. Let me erase this. So, we have a methyl group, CH3, that uses up three of our total number of hydrogens. Now, we have to look at the triplet. So that means it's hanging off of something that contains two hydrogens. So I'm going to use a different color for it. So we know it's hanging off of a carbon that has two hydrogens. 
Whoops. Won't let me undo. There we go. So it's hanging off of a carbon that has two hydrogens. We have an issue here. And that issue is these two hydrogens are chemically equivalent, but we've got two different possibilities here. And we know that whatever this carbon is attached to has to have some hydrogens on it. And the reason why I say that is if it didn't, let's say if the oxygen was right here, then these two hydrogens would split to four. But we've got two hydrogens that split to two, I'm sorry, split to three, and two hydrogens that split to six. So therefore it's not feasible that this is the only carbon with hydrogens that the lighter colored carbon is hanging off of. So we're going to hold off on this one for the moment. Okay? And instead, let's focus on this peak right here. Once again, there are three hydrogens. So this peak right here, we're going to use in this color. There are three hydrogens that are in the same environment, and they're next to something that has no hydrogens or that doesn't split. So I'm going to draw it over here. Now we've used up three carbons in eight of the hydrogens. We're finished with this peak and we're finished with this peak. We know that these two can't be connected together because otherwise it's propane and we'd be finished. Plus these two hydrogens would split to a septet to seven peaks and that doesn't that doesn't compute. So instead now we're gonna go ahead and start to try to figure out what this and this can be. We are missing two carbons and we've got to figure out which one of these is equal to that as well as what this could indicate. So to review what we've done so far, for this peak we know it's a CH3 group that it's adjacent to a carbon that has two hydrogens which we haven't assigned yet. We know that for this group right here it's a CH3 group and we don't know what it's attached to. It's attached to something it could either be an oxygen or a carbon that has no hydrogens on it. Okay. So then now let's go ahead and try to logically address the presence of this group right here. We can should be able to rule this signal out because whatever this CH2 group is attached to only has two hydrogens. So, therefore, this peak here must belong to this, whoops, sorry about that, to this CH2 group. If that's true, then that means that that CH2 group has to be next to something that has a total of five hydrogens, because since it's supposed to a to six peaks. So we've already got three, so that means it has to be next to another carbon that has two hydrogens. In doing so, we have one, two, three, four, five, would be equal to J. J plus one is six, that's six. Now, look here, we actually have also completed the integration for this. Because this peak there says that it has two hydrogens next to something that has two hydrogens. 
two hydrogens. Next to a carbon, it also has two hydrogens. So therefore, whatever that that CH2 group is attached to cannot have any hydrogens. If you go back to the original equation, it is C5, H10, and one oxygen. We've used one, two, three, four carbons, so we have one carbons left. We've used all ten hydrogens, so we just have a carbon and an oxygen. Plus, we know from RDB that there has to be a double bond. So therefore, the only thing left that could make sense is a carbonyl group. So we put this all together, we're going to have the following compound. We're going to have a CH3 group, which I'll draw it all out, which I usually don't like to do. Next, oh, that's this one. Next to a carbonyl which won't even be on the spectrum because this was a proton spectrum and there are no hydrogens there. <clears throat> Next to a CH2 group, which would be this one right here. Next to a CH2 group, that one right there. next to a CH3 group. This one right here. You can always double check to make sure that it works out. But we have a methyl, so three hydrogens. That's next door to something that doesn't have any. There we go. This is silent, but it does satisfy our ring double bond equation. This is two hydrogens next door to something that has two. So it makes it splits to three. This is two hydrogens next door to things that have a total of five, so it's supposed to six. And then this is three hydrogens next door to something that has two, so it's supposed to three. Hopefully this is helps, and I will give you additional examples in class.